Okay, so thank you very much for your kind introduction and welcome to my presentation. Um, during the last two or three days, we have already heard quite some talks where the angular luminescence spectroscopy has been used to determine the emitter, um, the emission zone in a full stack OLED or OLEC. Um, actually, what is the, the angular luminescence spectroscopy? It's as simple as that. We just measure the emission spectrum, be it electroluminescence or photoluminescence, as a function of the emission angle. And we can use this, as we have seen, to um, extract the emission zone from a full OLED stack, but we can also um, try to back extract the, ex and the, the orientation of the emitter dipoles within an emitter film. And very recently we started exploring the quantum dot down conversion properties using our um, new angular luminescence spectroscope instrument. So today I will focus on the extraction of the dipole orientation and, on the, uh, and show you some first results about the, the down conversion. So why do we care um, for horizontally allowed dipoles? It's in a very simple picture, picture we can um, assume that the dipoles are somehow statistically distributed, and if a dipole is rather vertically oriented, then we can see that most of its power is actually emitted with a with an a certain angle with respect to the substrate and some of the intensity is actually back reflected be it in the transport layer or in the substrate so it's actually kept uh, in the in the wave guided mode so we lose parts of the energy um, and of course if we find an emitter which is completely horizontally aligned then we have a better um, um, extraction of our intensity and ther therefore a higher EQE so just as a reminder if we have a dipole, in this case it's a vertically oriented dipole, then um, the intensity is, uh, and it, it's the dipole is oriented in the C plane, so the maximum intensity would be in the X and the Y plane, and the light is actually linearly polarized. And if we now imagine that we have a detector um, with a polarizer filter, so we can look at the P polarized and the S polarized intensity, then we would have the minimum intensity at zero degrees, and if we now move the detector around the dipole, we would um, have an increasing signal in the P-polarized emission. We can now imagine that we have um, a horizontally aligned dipole, and we can repeat the same um, um, Gedanken experiment, and we again move the, um, the detector around the dipole and we see that actually in this case we would have a decrease in the p-polarized intensity as a function of the of the angle and in the last case we have a dipole which is oriented um, parallel to the y-axis and it, in this case actually we would only have a signal from the s-polarized um, detector and this would basically be constant because actually the intensity of this vertical of this horizontal dipole is isotropic in, in this axis. So actually, we try to make use of this um, when we do the, the angular PL measurement um, in order to back extract the, the orientation of the dipole. But however, in a realistic case, in a realistic film, we have some um, superposition of many dipoles and of course we will also expect some superposition of these three very simple cases and furthermore we have many effects like back reflection at because our detector is, is actually not sitting in the same medium as the dipoles itself so we will have some refraction we will have some cavity effects we will have some refraction by and therefore we need a full optical model in order to back extract the dipole orientation on this slide i have made uh, a summary of different cases where we can see that actually the, the angular PL um, signal is really a fingerprint of the dipole orientation. So in the columns we have a very thin and on the, on the left we have a very thin device and on the right we have a rather thick device and in the bot uh, in the, on top we have a horizontally aligned dipole and in the in the bottom row we have a vertically aligned dipole and you can see that we can distinguish between thin and thick devices in the S polarized, actually this doesn't really work, um, we can distinguish between the thin and the thick, um, can you see something? 
Ah, okay. Um, between the thin and the thick case, because in the thin case we have rather sharp features, whereas in the thick case we have a very round S polarized um, angular dependence. And what is even more important, for instance, look at this minima and maxima in the angular dependence of the signal, and we can see that the, the relation between the minima and the maxima highly change as a function of time. <laughs> we try to make use of this in order to back extract the dipole. Um, we have very recently developed this new FELOS instrument, <coughs> and um, with this instrument, we can measure um, the, the emission. Okay. Um, so in this fellows instrument, we use a half, cyl um, half cylindrical lens, and using this lens, we can actually also extract the modes um, which otherwise would be captured in the in the substrate. And with this, only using this semi half cylindrical lens, we can also obtain the these modes we, which are very crucial in order to extract the dipole orientation. Otherwise, we would only see this very simple picture on the um, bottom left. Okay, um, I would like to show you some example that we have actually measured for one of our customers. So we got two samples. We got a pure emitter film on the left-hand side, and we got an emitter host system with 9% emitting molecules. Um, and actually, our customer had already characterized this film, the pure emitter film, with angular ellipsometry. And they could find the, the optical constants, and they could see some birefringence, and from these birefringence, they could find the, or they could at least estimate what is the average orientation of the dipoles. And <coughs> um, they sent us the, the blend sample, because actually from ellipsometry, they could not measure the optical properties of the emitter alone in the, in the blend system, because there you just measure some average optical properties of the emitter host system, and therefore we try to back extract the dipole orientation um, in this case as well with the um, angular PL. And this is some example of the, of the measured signal from Phelos, so we have the, in, um, the, the spectrum as a function of the S and the P polarized um, um, light and, and as a function of the angle, and of course we can integrate the spectrum to see the PL intensity, and this looks very similar to the, to the patterns I have shown you on my slide before. So, yeah, thank you. Um, so then what we do is we take our um, full optical model, and of course we have a couple of parameters. First of all, we need to know the optical constants. Typically we get them exactly from ellipsometry, or we use um, them as a fitting parameter. Then we have the film thickness, which can be determined from AFM, or it can also be a fitting parameter. Then we have the emission intensity, which just scales our um, signal up and down. And the most important is the emitter orientation. But also we need some assumption about the emission zone, but typically we just take an exponential decay from the side where we actually um, illuminate with the UV light. Okay, so the result was rather surprising. Unfortunately, we don't, exactly, we don't know exactly why this is the case, but we found, first of all, an excellent uh, agreement between the simulation and the measurement. So the solid line is the simulation and the, the triangles are the, the measurement. In both cases, in the, em in the pure film and in the emitter host system. And we also find that in both cases, the dipoles are slightly horizontally aligned and even in the host guest system. So actually, I would love to know the secret of this, um, of this customer, how they um, manage to align uh, a, a guest in a host system. So unfortunately, I cannot tell you, but it's, it was rather surprising to see this. Um, I was furthermore performing some sensitivity analysis for the method, but I think I will postpone this to the, to the, the workshop in the afternoon. So I will skip this slide, and I would like to very quickly show you some first results um, about quantum dot down conversion. Just as a very quick reminder, we have already seen this in the talk of Professor Xi in, um, this morning, that using quantum dot down conversion, we can have very well-defined colors, and um, this has very recently been used in, in modern QD TVs, to, which have a, rather, a much broader color um, spectrum. Um, what we have been doing is we took a blue um, OLED as a, as a backlight for the down conversion film, and then we 
we first measured the angular dependence of this blue OLED, which looks like this. So we have, the, the, of course, the highest emission at zero degrees angle, and you can see how the spectrum changes as a function of the angle. And, on the, and afterwards, we packed this blue OLED on top of the down conversion film. Um, and this is actually a film from Avantama, so this material has actually already been mentioned this morning, and we can see that, uh, that a small fraction of the blue light is actually absorbed by the, the quantum dots and re-emitted um, uh, um, in, the, in the green. And furthermore, we have some film from a Samsung TV model 2016, and we have done the same, and actually this um, film has a down conversion into the green as well as into the red. And of course, we can now do several very interesting analyses using the angular information. For instance, we can first of all integrate over the spectrum and look how the, how the, 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 like the energy which is emitted in a certain angle changes as a function of the angle. And we see that at zero degree, we have the most um, intensity coming from the, from the backlight, but at a large angle, we actually have in more intensity in the, in the green in this case, or in, in that case, and this comes, of course, from the down conversion as well as from the scattering of the, the quantum dot particles. And we can also integrate over the angle. This is very similar to what you actually measure in an integrated sphere. And from this, we can measure how much energy is actually conserved, um, which is either scattered or down converted, but it's not absorbed or emitted um, back into the, the light source. So this is just an, a few examples of what you can do. Um, with very simple data analysis um, of Phelos measurements. Um, but since um, the Cephas version 4.6, we have released a model for the quantum dot down conversion. So what we do is we, um, we have uh, quite some parameters, such as the quantum dot radius, its concentration, the refractive index of the quantum particles. And from this, we calculate a scattering cross-section and, a, and a, an average mean free pass. And we have then implemented a a ray tracing engine which calculates the, the amount of transmitted, scattered, and down converted light as a function of the emission angle. Of course, this all also depends on the absorption and the emission spectrum of the quantum dots. And just to, to show you a very simple example of typical parameter, um, which are um, variated in, varied in, in this example, so we have the concentration, and we at very low concentration, we have we see only the, the transmission of the backlight, whereas we have increasing absorption, so the transmitted signal goes down, whereas the quantum dot down conversion goes up. And what is very interesting is that we also see this redshift, as we have already seen this morning, and we think that this comes from the self-absorption of the quantum dots. And therefore, the more quantum dots we have, the bigger is the self-absorption, and that's why we have a, a bigger redshift. And we can also play around with the quantum yields and many other parameters, and you see that these, these parameters have different effects. Um, the slides I'm showing you now is um, like very preliminary results. Of course, we are now trying to get a link between the measurement and the experiment, uh, the, the measurement and the simulation, and this is actually one of the first fit we got when we have many free parameters because we don't know much details about the, the quantum dots themselves nor about the, how the, the layer is actually made. Um, but we can see that these first results look very promising because we get an excellent agreement between the, the measurement and the simulation. And I hope this will this give you an impression of what will follow from our side in the near future. Of course, we will try to to find some way of how we can use this angular information in order to back extract the crucial parameters of this film such that in turn we can use our model to, um, to optimize these films in simulation to, to save some time in the lab. Let me conclude my presentation. So I hope I was able to show you that the angular luminescence spectroscopy is a very versatile tool to um, to study emitter films or full OLEDs or now even quantum dot down conversion films. And of course, what is also crucial is to combine the experiment with the simulation in order to back extract the parameters and to verify the physical models. And with this, I would like to thank you for your kind attention. And I would like to invite you for the Philos presentation this afternoon right after lunch. Thank you very much.